Hey everybody, Mr. J here. Do you ever just stop, pause, and feel that heart beating in your chest and wonder, I wonder how much blood it's pumping out per minute? You know, these are the questions I have all the time too, so let me answer that for you. The amount of blood, or the volume of blood ejected by your heart every minute is cardiac output. Now there's a couple things I want to break down within that. We're talking about volume, so the amount of blood per minute from the heart. So we need two different values here. We need heart rate to account for the minute, and we also need the stroke volume, so the actual amount of volume coming out of the heart, okay? So stroke volume at rest is around 70 milliliters of blood. So that's basically saying every time your heart contracts, so you feel that beat in your chest, your ventricles are pumping out 70 milliliters of blood. Well, we've got the volume thing taken care of, but now we've got to talk about the heart rate. And your heart rate is in beats per minute, so BPMs. And the average American, or I guess the average human, has about 70 or so beats per minute. So it's actually pretty easy to calculate, right? We've got 70 and 70, which go, comes to about 5,000 milliliters of blood every minute. That's just about over a gallon to a gallon and a half. So it's a pretty good amount of blood your heart is beating per minute. Now, in this video, I wanna talk about what actually affects cardiac output. It's gonna be a pretty lengthy video because there's a lot of stuff that can, can affect this value of the heart. So first off, we're gonna go through some intrinsic control pathways. So within the heart itself, how can it alter cardiac output by altering heart rate and stroke volume? And then we're going to come over here and talk about some extrinsic factors, things that can come from the outside to the heart and affect cardiac output. So let's get started. Intrinsic control. The three terms I want you to remember are preload, afterload and contractility. Those three things are going to affect the intrinsic control aspect of regulating cardiac output. But before we do that, we need to understand one thing. Well, two things actually. First off, when the heart is relaxing, it is going to be filling with blood passively. So there's going to be veins that bring blood back to the heart, either through the pulmonary or the systemic circulation. So either from the lungs or from the body. And this is going to be our venous return. So as these veins are bringing blood back to the heart, when it's filling, filling, relaxing, this is called diastole. So during venous return, this is called diastole because the heart is relaxing, okay? So heart's relaxing and it's filling, 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 filling with blood, okay? So at the end of this relaxation period, there's going to be a certain volume of blood in the heart that we are going to call the end diastolic volume, which is also labeled EDV. So if you ever see EDV on a test, it just means at the end of diastole, at the end of rest, how much blood is in the heart, okay? And on average, we'll say it's about 120 to 140 milliliters, so we'll just say 130 milliliters of blood are in the heart when it's done relaxing, okay? Then, once the heart contracts, we are going to have another volume in the heart because not all the blood will actually get ejected out. So the blood will get ejected out as it contracts. And that's called systole or systole. Okay, so when the heart's contracting, it's called systole. It's pumping the blood out of the ventricles, out through the either aorta or the pulmonary artery, but it's not perfectly efficient. It's actually going to remain a little bit of blood in the heart itself, give or take, we'll say 50 milliliters. Okay, so this was our end diastolic volume. It's filling, 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 got to 130 milliliters. It contracted, and then there was about 50 milliliters left over or so, okay? Well, that volume occurred at the end of systole, at the end of contraction. So we call this the end systolic volume, which we could say is ESV. Now, I did this wrong, I realize I'm going to put this to 120 or something. Because if we take our end diastolic volume minus our end systolic volume, 120 minus 70, look at what we get. 70 milliliters for our stroke volume, okay? So this is on average, this is just an example. 
So we need to understand the filling and then after it contracts, how much blood is left because I'll show you why. During venous return, blood is pooling into the heart, okay? Think of it as it's loading up. It's pre-loading up, right? So during preload, what is happening is the heart muscle itself is stretching. And what's interesting is there's a mechanism called the Frank Starling Law of the Heart that says as the heart stretches more, it will have the capacity con to contract back harder or stronger, okay? So think about it this way. If you ever have a bow and arrow and you're shooting a bow and you wanna shoot as far as you can, you need to stretch, 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 stretch really far back and then the arrow will go further. Same with the heart. The further this heart can stretch and stretch and fill and fill, it will strength, strongly contract that blood out of the heart. So think about it. If we increase preload, so this is considered preload, if we increase this value, so basically the heart's filling up with more, if we increase it, we will likely increase our stroke volume. Because think about it, if we're loading it more, it will contract more, and our end systolic volume, or our end diastolic volume will be greater, end systolic volume will likely be less because it's contracting so hard. So that will increase our stroke volume, thus increasing our cardiac output. So that's really interesting. So one thing I wanna mention here, one thing that can increase venous return, if we want to increase it, exercise. Okay, so think about when you're starting to exercise, you're actually compressing the veins and you're bringing blood back to the heart faster. So as that occurs, it fills up bigger so then it can contract harder and it will need to actually contract faster as well. So that's why your heart rate basically increases and your stroke volume will also increase during exercise, okay? So we're already talking about how we can change our heart's physiology so that it can help us do whatever we're doing. Okay, so now let's talk a little more about the afterload because afterload's a little confusing, but I think you'll understand it. So first off, when the heart is preparing to contract, it's a closed system though. Your circulatory system is a closed system. And so you have these arteries leaving the heart and these arteries have these little valves on them. Okay, so if it's in your aorta, it's called the aortic uh, semilunar valve. And if it's in the pulmonary artery, it's going to be the pulmonary semilunar valve. Well, like I said, it's a closed system. So as this heart is filling up, there's actually blood that is outside of this valve that is pushing back this direction. That's why the valve is there, to prevent that blood from coming back this direction, right? But think about it. When we contract the heart, we have to push blood out this direction, right? So afterload is just the measure of force that's coming back on this valve that the heart must overcome. So this is afterload, which is the force the heart has to overcome in order to pump that blood out. Now think about it, what are some things that could affect afterload? Well, like I said, this is a closed system, so there's gonna be blood pooling back on that. So the more blood you have, right, the more blood you have, the more blood will be pushing back on those valves. So, interestingly, if you gain a lot of weight, so for example, a 300 pound person versus a 150 pound person, the 300 pound person will have a lot more blood vessels, a lot more blood, so therefore, they will have high afterload. So think about it. Why do people, why do people who are obese have a high afterload? They have more blood, and a lot of the times that also causes high blood pressure too. The heart's having to work so hard just to push that blood out that it gets, well, does a lot of things, but it could increase your blood pressure, and the heart will have to get bigger and bigger to, comp to compensate for that high pressure pushing back on those valves. So that is afterload, the amount of force that we have to overcome to get that blood out of the heart from the ventricles. Awesome, so we've already got preload down, we've got afterload down. Now let's talk about contractility, okay? Contractility uh, is kind of an interesting one because it's talking about how effective the heart muscle is itself in shortening, in contracting. So a couple things can affect the contractility that I'm going to point out. One thing, and I'm just gonna come inside this heart for that reason. One thing that can affect the contractility is training. So think about it. If you exercise any muscle, 
Okay, so you do bicep curls uh, 30 times a day for five years. Your biceps will likely be very efficient, very strong and toned to lift weights. Well, if you exercise like cardiovascularly, so heart exercise, so say you go for jogs every day, your heart will get stronger. It will get more efficient. So that means we can um, <clears throat> increase the amount of stroke volume, but it won't have to work as hard. Okay. So that's one thing that can affect uh, cardiac output and intrinsic control is training through uh, the pathway of contractility. But the second thing is things called ionotropins. And if you've taken classes with me, you've seen the word ion before because this deals with positively charged ions that are flowing in and out of the heart tissue. Now you have learned potentially that calcium is a very big indicator of contraction. So the more calcium you have in the heart or available to the heart tissue, the stronger it will contract. So ionotropins are things like epinephrine because epinephrine Epinephrine increases the amount of calcium that the heart can release at a time. So the stroke volume will increase because it's pumping harder, thus increasing the cardiac output. Okay, so that's one thing. There are other ionotropins that can actually decrease it as well. Um, so decreasing cardiac output could also be a thing. Uh, but I just wanted to point that one out with uh, ionotropins. Okay, so this is a really good segue because I just mentioned epinephrine. Now, epinephrine is interesting and I'm just gonna merge epinephrine and norepinephrine into the same thing. I use them interchangeably. Um, there will be different places where epinephrine and norepinephrine are secreted that others aren't, but I'm just gonna group it into one. It can be one of two things. Epinephrine can be a neurotransmitter or it can be a hormone. Okay, so let's start with the neurotransmitter aspect of, of epinephrine. <clears throat> and we need to get into extrinsic control for this. So come with me over here. This diagram right here, this is going to be your brain. This is going to be what your heart would actually look like if I drew it properly, because I just like these shapes hearts. And then these are going to be your adrenal glands, okay? And they're going to come into play in here in a second. In your brain, <clears throat> specifically in your brain stem, you've got this cardiac uh, center, the cardioregulatory center that has either sympathetic or parasympathetic neurons. I'm going to draw the sympathetic with red. So these are going to be sympathetic neurons coming in and talking to the heart. And then I'm going to have some parasympathetic neurons that can come and talk to the heart. If you remember, sympathetic stimulation prepares your body for fight or flight. So these guys are going to increase cardiac output. They're going to increase heart activity. Okay. Interestingly, the sympathetic neurotransmitter is epinephrine. Okay. So sympathetic neurons will secrete epinephrine and I'll just draw epinephrine as this little dot. So this will be epinephrine and what epinephrine will do is it can talk to the SA nodes so the pacemaker cells of the heart to speed up the heart rate and it can also d uh, dump out and actually go to the heart muscle itself. So this would be like a heart muscle here. It can also talk to the heart muscle, increase calcium levels and you know what calcium does, it increases contractions, right? So if we have more calcium in the muscle cells, more epinephrine in the pacemaker cells, we are both increasing our heart rate from the pacemakers, increasing our stroke volume by way of contractility in the heart muscle cell, the heart muscle itself, which is really cool. Okay, so that's sympathetic. Another thing that the sympathetic ner nervous system can do to amplify this, especially during times of like exercise or, you know, running away from a bear that's chasing you, it can also go down and talk to the adrenal glands. Now, why would it want to do that? Well, the adrenal glands are massive storehouses of norepinephrine and epinephrine. Okay, so in this case, it was used as a neurotransmitter. But in this case, we're actually going to dump epinephrine into the bloodstream. If we dump it into the bloodstream, this is much more effective at influencing the heart muscle, at influencing a lot of other body parts, uh, perhaps uh, muscles themselves to actually get a lot of glucose in and uh, do a lot of exercise when you're running. 
So by dumping epinephrine into the bloodstream by way of the adrenal medulla specifically, the middle part of the adrenal glands, um, that's going to amplify this whole effect to really stimulate that heart rate, speed it up, strengthen it so that we increase our cardiac output in, uh, in any sort of situation where you need to, like exercise. Okay. So that is all sympathetic nerve fiber and an extrinsic control. Uh, so we talked about a neurotransmitter here. We also talked about hormones. So this is great because extrinsic control is all by neurotransmitters and hormones. So both of these play a role in increasing or decreasing cardiac output. So all of this stuff that I've just told you basically increases cardiac output. But what can decrease it? Well, several things, but I'm going to focus primarily on this parasympathetic nerve fiber. So this parasympathetic nerve fiber will release acetylcholine. So this will be acetylcholine. And it will decrease cardiac output by slowing down the heart and decreasing the contractility of the heart. Okay, so there you have it. This is cardiac output. This is a very brief overview of how it works. Again, we talked about intrinsic control, so the preload and afterload, the contractility of the heart. And we talked a little bit about how we can control the heart from the brain, specifically talking to the heart through neurotransmitters, or also talking to the adrenal glands, specifically the adrenal medulla, that dumps epinephrine into the bloodstream and increases cardiac output.